I'm going to be speaking the sixth message in a series called The Corinthian Problem. The title this morning is The Tabernacle of David. I know that many have come here this morning and you're saying, you know, it's so heavy out there. <clears throat> Times are so difficult. Please just speak something to lighten my heart. Well, it, it may not seem like that at the beginning, but if you hold with it, the Lord's given me a message that's going to bring you through to something of freedom that can only be found if you and I will embrace the truth. You shall know the truth, Jesus said, and the truth shall set you free. It's, it's not good feeling that sets the church of Jesus Christ free. It's the truth. Truth digs. Truth challenges. Truth goes underneath foundations that are not built in Christ. Tears them down, but then truth builds. And truth gives an anointing, and truth brings strength. You shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. First Corinthians chapter 10, please, if you go there. And then find the book of Amos, please, also in the Old Testament. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Hosea Joel, and Amos. Old Testament, and put a marker there. We're going to speak on the tabernacle of David. Father, God Almighty, if ever there was a time and a season to hear from you, it's now. Lord, I yield my body and mind and everything that I have as an instrument in your hand. I ask you, God, to speak to your church. Speak to your beloved bride that you have gathered here in this house today and those that will be listening on the Internet and by tape in the future. God, speak something deep, Lord. We're not looking for just a light. <clears throat> We're not looking for something just casual that will get us through the day. We need truth that will get us through to the end. Help us to understand, Lord, that you only send your word to heal, not to destroy. I thank you for this with all my heart. Thank you for the weightiness of the Holy Spirit in this sanctuary this morning. There's an evidence that you're doing something profound and powerful in our midst. We give you all of the glory for this. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. The Tabernacle of David. Moreover, brethren, I would, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and they all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen to them for examples. And they are written for our admonition, that means our instruction, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now what the Lord is saying, there's a pattern of what happened to certain types of behavior in the Old Testament. As people just chose to embrace, they had a clear revelation of God. They had the scripture indicates that Christ followed them. They were able to drink of that life that Paul said was Christ. They tempted, in verse 9, Christ. And because of these things, there was a great and encroaching judgment and weakness that came into their lives. All these things happen for examples to us, and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Verse 12, Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted, above that you are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. Now Paul is saying to the Corinthian church, we've been speaking about the Corinthians. Now remember, the issue with Corinth was that there was a value system in the society around them. It was an affluent society. It 
there, there was a saying in that generation to live like a Corinthian meant to live in sensuality and in material affluence. There was a temple in the middle of Corinth, and even though there was only 2,000 free men in that society at that time, there were 200,000 free men, rather, and there were 500,000 slaves. There were 1,000 prostitutes in that temple. And so their, their religion, in a sense, was, was fornication. It was an incredibly wicked society. And in that society, the Apostle Paul preached and founded a church. The problem that he faced in Corinth, the foundational problem that seemed to be the root of most everything else, is that this society settled on just being, this church rather, settled on just being a little bit different than the society around it. They tolerated things in their midst. Paul said that you shouldn't tolerate it. They opened the doors to people who exalted themselves and took from them and began to spiritually really uh, abuse them for no other, no other way to explain it, actually. They began to smite the simplicity of Christ in them. They began to take from them. They, they were exalting themselves. And there was a selfishness in these people that were causing them to push the poor to the sides as it is of the temple as they gathered together around what they thought to be the Lord's Supper. And Paul had a broken heart for this church. It's a type, in, in a sense, folks, of the society we're living in today. It's a type of some of what has happened to the testimony of Christ in our generation. And Paul, speaking now to this church as a spiritual father, he tells them in verse 13, your spiritual condition is not such that you cannot escape it. Christ triumphed over all the carnality within you. That which has brought others in the past to spiritual defeat. But God says in Christ he will be faithful to keep you from it. This is what Paul is saying in verse 13. He speaks about all these things that happened to the children of Israel throughout certain points in their history. And then he says, listen, you will be tempted to do these things. This, this is an inherent flaw in all of fallen humanity. And you will be drawn. There will be people who plead with you to go in this direction. There will be voices that will be raised. There will be things in your own heart that want to lure you away from the simplicity of living for God in Christ. And Paul says, but you cannot be overcome if it's in your heart to walk in truth. Christ triumphed over all of these things. You have a power, a resident power within you. And God will be faithful to keep you. He will not allow you to be tempted or tested above that you can bear. Now, folks, you can stand on that. You can build your life on that one verse of Scripture. God in Christ will not allow you to be tested beyond what you can bear. No matter what you're going through this morning. No matter what difficulty you might be facing. The devil will come and say, well, try this. Or complain against these people. Or do this. Or reach out and grab this. He will come to you with a theology out of hell itself to try to get you away from the simplicity that's in Christ. But Paul says, in reality, if you will turn to him... He will not allow you to be tested above that you can bear, but will make a way for you to escape it. Praise be to God. Then in verse 14, he says, wherefore, wherefore, in other words, bringing a concluded thought in measure to verse 13, he says, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. And the definition of idolatry, as I see it in this verse, is everything that has its roots in setting your own judgment and thoughts above that which God has already clearly spoken. Flee from making yourself God. Flee from exalting your knowledge above the knowledge of God. Flee from trying to reason everything. Creating another Christ that makes an easier way for you. Flee from all of this idolatry. And trust God to bring you through. Folks, we're going to need to have this trust to get through these coming days. And the days that we're living in. I know there's some of you this morning that are saying, Don't even talk to me about the coming days. The days that have already come are enough for me. I need the strength of God. Well, if you'll hold through with this, you're going to find the strength of God. There's going to be deliverance this morning. There's going to be victory. People are going to walk out of imprisonments of the enemy and into the life of Christ. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, And the last days perilous times shall come. He begins the description of these perilous days with the following words. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Now, folks, if you study... Chapter 3, you're going to find out that everything that Paul discusses, they're going to be covetous, they're going to be boastful, they're going to be proud, they're going to be disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, incapable of retaining truth. You just go through the whole list. They're going to have a form of godliness, but their lives are going to deny the power of God. 
They're going to resist the simplicity of God as Janus and Jambres in the uh, book of Exodus with these, these two spiritists as it is who had gotten access to Pharaoh's throne of power as they withstood the simplicity of God's plan in Moses. These men will withstand. They will withstand this giving of oneself. Moses was a man who simply was given to the will of God. As foolish as the plan may have seemed, he embraced this plan. He had a stick in his hand and a one-line sermon, and that's what God sent him with. And he was so weak that he needed his brother to help him deliver this, the one-line message. And yet he went in and he trusted that God was through his life going to bring this incredible victory. A selfless man. It's, it's always been a selfless man, a selfless woman, a selfless people who are given to the work of God that doesn't make sense to the natural mind. It's always been this type of a person that God has used to bring about the supernatural and to bring about miraculous deliverance. Paul says in the last days, men will resist this selflessness. They, they will believe, as Janice and Jambres did, that the way to change is access to power, halls of political authority and such like. They will believe that there's another way other than this selflessness that is only found in Christ and in his true body of believers. If you study First Timothy or Second Timothy chapter 3, you'll see that every ungodly practice that Paul lists that will be part of the last days are built on the foundation of the fact that men will be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own selves. There will be a self-focus in the last days. It will creep into the church. It will permeate society. It will all be about me. Everything I do will be about me. Everything I believe will be about me. Every place I put my hand will be about me. Every direction my feet find will be about me. And that will be in the church. It will actually permeate much of the church in the last days. A foundation of men being lovers of their own selves. Now go to the Old Testament, please, to the book of Amos. And we'll begin uh, around chapter 8 in Amos. And uh, we're going to look at it in a historical context. Because this is where Paul is speaking about in Corinthians. That these things that happened were examples to us. They're a type, they're a shadow of what, where we have come to as the body of Christ in our generation. Now Amos shows us the spiritual condition under which the people had, and the nation had fallen just prior to the judgment of God which was coming to their borders. As a matter of fact, they were only about, I think when Amos wrote, about 30 years away from an incredibly horrific judgment. And God raised up an ordinary man, a shepherd, and brought him in to warn the people. But as is mostly the case there, quite often when society has degenerated to the, 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 the point, and especially those who claim to believe in God, where Amos found himself prophesying, there's, there's not that many that are willing to hear anymore. God help us in our generation. God help America. God help Canada. God help us to be able to hear where we're at and where we need to go. Oh, folks, there's going to be people terrified in the streets one day. Just as when the towers were hit here in New York City, everything that was of God could stand and everything that was not of God was terrified and confused. Chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 2, begin at verse 2. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And he said, I, I see a basket of summer fruit. And then he said, Lord, and then said the Lord to me, the end has come upon my people of Israel. I will not pass by them again anymore. The Lord said, I've tried. I've sent voices. I've warned. But there is a point, folks. There's a point where people won't hear anymore. There's a point where, tragically, we don't expect the nation to hear. We don't expect the ungodly to listen. It's the church that God speaks to. It's his body. And there's a time, there's a season throughout history. If you're a student of church history, you'll know this. That the people won't hear anymore. They've settled in. They've, they've, they've found a form of worship that they find very satisfying and very pleasing. And they will not be moved even if God, if Christ himself stood and preached, they won't be moved from their position. And God came to Amos and he said, and why would they listen to him? He's just an ordinary man. He's got no pedigree. He's got no huge degrees behind his name. He's got no big litany of success. He's just an ordinary shepherd that comes in and begins to speak to the people. And they're so highly offended that this man, as always, would come in and begin to challenge this spiritual bankruptcy. All through history, folks, this has been the pattern. God help us. God help you and me that we can hear if he's speaking. 
And he said, I'll not pass by them again anymore. That, that to me is the most fearful statement. That's the most tragic place that a person who claims to know God could ever find themselves in. When God says, I'm not coming to you anymore. I'm not speaking to you anymore. You've hardened your heart to the point you don't want to hear. I'm not speaking to you. I'll give you what you want to hear. That came to a point in another Old Testament book. He says, when the people come to inquire of me and they have set up idols in their heart, the Lord himself says, I'll answer them according to the multitude of their idols. I'll let them, I'll release them as it is. I'll just, I'll just let them go to what they want and what's in their hearts. And <clears throat> verse 3 he says, the songs of the temple shall be howlings at that day, says the Lord God. There will be many dead bodies in every place, and they'll cast them forth with silence. The Lord says, there's, there's going to be a, a stunned silence come to the people. All these voices that weren't speaking for God won't know what to say. The songs of what should have been, or at least were purported to be praise, are going to be gone. Folks, only that which cannot be shaken is going to remain. Yes, Isaiah said there will be a song in the fire. Thanks. Thank God for that. But that song doesn't just come when the fire starts, folks. That song is born before the fire. The Hebrew boys had that song before they were thrust into this time of difficulty. You have to get the song now. You don't get it in that day. You get it now. You determine in your heart that no matter what happens, I'm going to learn who God is. I'm going to walk with Christ. I'm going to praise Him with all my heart. I'm not going to hold back. I'm not going to close my heart to him. I'm not going to settle in at some halfway place to salvation. I'm going to find him, and I'm going to find his will for my life and my generation. He says, hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, in verse 4, even to make the poor of the land to fail. And here's what they say, saying, when will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat? making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit. Folks, they were anxious to leave the presence of the Lord. I, I can see this, to continue in commerce. They're in the church on Sunday, but they're, they're, they're watching their watches, hoping soon it's going to be over, so I can get back to making money. I can get back to what really, really is gripping my heart, what really my life is all about. I want to get back there and begin to do these things. Getting gain, it says, by any means, including that which is against the law of the nation and the law of God. Going out and having justified this self-seeking, having justified living a life that is all for myself, no matter how I have to do it. Verse 6 says that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, and you sell the refuse of the wheat. Now, here's the indictment of God against this people. He says, you're using every man for personal advantage. You're losing the heart of God for the poor and the disadvantaged. As a matter of fact, in chapter 2 and verse 7, he says, You trample on the heads of the poor in your quest to get things of the dust, he calls them. Things that have been created out of dust. In order to get them, you, 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 the Lord is looking down. And he says, I see, I see people who are called by my name literally stepping on the heads of the poor on their journey to get things that are made out of dust. They don't last. And then he goes on. In chapter 6 and verse 3, he says, You put far away the evil day and cause the seed of violence to come near. In other words, this is a spiritual climate that puts the righteous judgment of God far away. I remember just before the towers were hit, there's a certain man that I believe I know is a false prophet. I don't believe he is. I know he is. There's a step beyond belief. A false prophet came to New York City and was, this man was having, and perhaps still has some influence in what purports to be the body of Christ, walking down Broadway. This is around August of 2001. God is not going to judge New York City. There will be no judgment come here. This city is, God loves this city. This city is not in for any hard times. I remember seeing the, the, uh, the cameo of it and I was wondering as I saw it, I wonder if the towers were in the distance of, uh, this false prophet. One of the, greatest difficulties that the church will ever face is the rise of false prophets right before the judgment of God comes right before difficult times will be these rise of voices that say that nothing but good times are ahead of us Peter says in second Peter chapter 3 verses 3 and 4 in the last days there will be scoffers they're walking after their own lusts and they will say where's the promise of his coming now these scoffers folks are not outside of the church they're in the church because outside of the church, nobody really cares about Christ's coming. 
No, these are inside the church. These are scoffers. They walk up to their own lust and they say, look, don't listen to all the gloom and doom preachers that are out there today. There's not, matter of fact, there's not very many that are talking about judgment. But don't listen to them. Numerous good days are ahead. Where is this promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue just as they have been all throughout time. So now just go out, buy, sell, and get gain. Live like in the days of Noah, as if Christ is not coming. But yet, folks, the scripture says suddenly, suddenly he comes. Suddenly the whole world is thrown into a tailspin. Suddenly, Isaiah said, suddenly in one hour, all everything around begins to change. And difficulty comes. Where is the promise of his coming? They say. Amos chapter 6 again verses 4 and 5. They lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches. Eating the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall. That chant to the sound of the viol and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. In other words they focus on personal ease and the incomplete worship that accompanies it. Take notice here that. It says they have to invent to themselves worship. They, 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 they can't, they have to invent a type of worship that doesn't confront their spiritual bankruptcy. And folks, we've seen some of that in our generation. I find some songs that are sung in certain places so incredibly annoying. They don't even make sense. You, you can't even sing them. They don't even have a tune. They're like an invention from somewhere and you stand there I remember being in one church the only one singing was the worship leader nobody else could sing the songs didn't even make any spiritual sense doctrinal sense and musical sense but they're an invention of, of hearts that don't really want to go with God they don't really want what living a selfless Christ-centered life is all about and so they invent this worship verse 6 says they drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments but they're not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. They're, they're preoccupied with personal joy and anointing. We live in a generation where people want to experience the supernatural without entering into its purpose. That's where we're living now. They, people are running all over the country. They're running all over the world now looking for the supernatural, wanting to experience the supernatural. They, they, they would rather lay on the floor and Cluck like a chicken, then go to Africa and feed children who are starving to death. They don't want the purposes of God. They want to experience the anointing. They want to experience the supernatural. They want to lie on the couch and sing beautiful songs about how much they love God, but do not want to enter into the work of God. They're not grieved, Amos said, for the afflictions of Joseph. They're not grieved for the brother who's sold off into slavery and who's suffering unjustly. There's, they put this out of their conscience and... Subsequently, their whole sense of worship is a fraud. Verse 7 says, Now they're going to go captive with the first that go captive. And the banquet of them that stretch themselves shall be removed. And in other words, they were completely unaware of their true spiritual position. The Lord says, Now when judgment comes, these are going first. I'm going to remove them. I've got to take them out of my house. Because they are an abomination to truth. Amos chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. And Amaziah said to Amos, O thou seer, go flee thee away into the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there. But prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. You see, this is what happens now. There's a, Amos is speaking for God. He's trying to warn the people. But now there are voices raised against him. And they say, now don't prophesy here at Bethel. This is where we worship. This is where truth is. We've got the history. We've walked this thing longer than you have. We're on a spiritual journey to be blessed. Remember at Bethel is where Jacob put his head on a pillow. And where Jacob was on this journey for the blessing of God. And he had a dream and he saw angels ascending and descending on the ladders of, that extended all the way to heaven. And these people now are saying, no, we're on this journey. We're on this journey to be blessed. And Amos, we don't want you interrupting this. We, we are following the history of, as we see it. But history should have taught them that an inwardly corrupt man can't find the blessing of God in his own reasoning. They don't follow this through to the logical conclusion. Jacob was seeking the blessing, but at that particular point at Bethel, the blessing had not yet fully come on him because he was inwardly corrupt and God had to deal with this corruption. 
He needed a new nature. Remember Jacob, he would, he would trample anybody to get the blessing. He would lie to his own father. He would deceive his own brother. He would do whatever he had to. This is what we're talking about today, to get this blessing. But when he finally met face to face with God and wrestled with God, God took away this natural strength that was in him. He put a limp upon him and Jacob became a new man. Not a swindler any longer, but a prince with God and a man who had influence over men. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. I see Jacob now coming out of the wilderness. He's no longer strutting along in self-assuredness. He's got a limp. He's no longer driving over the top of other people to get what he wants. He tells Esau's brother, he says, you go ahead. He said, I'll join you in due time. I'm not going to travel any faster than the young ones that are with us can travel. I'm not going to overdrive them because they won't have the strength to make the journey. What a difference. This man now has truly found the blessing of God. He has a new nature. Praise be to God. He cares about the people, not about himself. That's what I'm speaking about this morning. He cares. You're not blessed until you care about people. Don't tell me you're blessed until you have a heart. For the poor, you have a heart for the widow, you have a heart for the downtrodden. Don't tell me you're blessed. You might have money, but you're not blessed. Don't tell me you're blessed until you have this heart. This heart that says, I'm not going to live. I'm not going to undertake the rest of this journey for myself. But I'm going to live it for others. I'm going to be a strength to the weak. I'm going to be a support to the widow. I'm going to go to those that have nobody that cares about them. And I'm going to show them in the power of God that is within me. I'm going to live and my life is going to be a demonstration of the fact that there is a God who's alive from the dead. Who loves them passionately and died for them. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. This is the blessing of the Lord. This is the blessing of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 In chapter 8 and verse 10, he says, I'll turn your feasts into mourning and your songs into lamentation. I'll bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness on every head. And I'll make it as the morning of an only son and the end thereof is a bitter day. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I'll send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They'll wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east. They shall run to and fro, and seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and the young men faint for thirst, that swear by the sin of Samaria, and say, Thy God, O Dan, lives, and the manner of Beersheba lives, even they shall fall and never rise up again. And... Folks, he just says, I'm going to take this song away. There's going to be a famine for hearing the true words of God because they've chosen to worship at a place that falls short of the truth. They've set up altars that are short of where I've called the people to worship, where where I've called you as a body, the Lord says, to serve me. These altars have fallen short of this place. Therefore, why do you think people for 15 to 20 years now have been running around the world looking for the word of God and not able to find it? Because they've set up altars. If they had found him, if they did know him, they wouldn't be flying all over the world looking for him. He says the young, the the fair virgins and the young men shall faint for thirst. In other words, there's going to be a loss of the next generation. But folks, I'm not willing to stand by and I know neither are many of you and watch this next generation just slide into hell without God. There's not going to be a loss of the next generation. Praise be to God. There's going to be a people who do stand up and do live for the real Christ and do preach the real gospel. And there's an evidence in their lives that what they're preaching is not just theology. It's become a practical experience. Amos 9 verse 11. Follow with me, please, as best as you can. He says, in that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I'll raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. Now, there are many interpretations of this. Some commentators talk about Jew and Gentile will worship as it was meant to be together. And no doubt, there's great truth in that. And that will and is happening in our generation. But also, in the context of what we're speaking about this morning, here's the way I see this. The tabernacle of David. God says, I'm going to raise it up again. This is my hope. If I I didn't have this vision, it would be easy to lose heart in this generation. It would be easy to quit preaching and just go home and live out the rest of our days just holding the fort as it is. Well, actually, it wouldn't be easy. My wife says I would absolutely die. I'd wither up and die in that kind of a place. She says you could never do that. There's too much passion in my heart that God has planted there 
for his people and for his truth. I'll raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen. And I see it as seeking God in the manner that is written in his word. Think about David, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 17. It says, they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. I see David worshiping God. I hear a worship that is pure. It is clean. I feel the joy of the Lord. Michal, which is the daughter actually of the fallen kingdom of Saul, in her heart despises this. She sees this. She hates this purity of worship. She can endure, I think, almost anything until there is finally a people and a man who are truly worshiping God in spirit and in truth. David had tried this once before, but you remember along the procession, God had killed a man called Uzzah. And David was grieved with it. And he said, why? I was trying to bring this, this ark of God's presence into the center of Jerusalem. And Lord, you, you killed the parade as it is. Why did you do it? And the Lord spoke to him later on in First Chronicles fifteen thirteen, And he said, God made a breach upon us because we sought him not after the due order. In other words, there is a way that we were to do this that was clearly written in the Word. But we chose to operate outside of the Word of God. We, we, we felt we had a revelation, perhaps, or we had some extra biblical knowledge that would add to the parade as it is. The Lord put out His hand and stopped the whole thing. He says, no, this is not spirit and truth. This is not coming into the center of Jerusalem. You will never know the fullness of the joy of the Lord until you do it the way I have called you to worship me. Praise be to God. Remember, Jesus said, the Father seeks people to worship Him in spirit and in truth. You cannot have one without the other, folks. And many people have tried to have the spirit without the truth. With extra biblical revelation and the hodgepodge of false prophets that purports itself to be revelation from God. But it isn't in the Bible. It's not part of God's word. Well, folks, when David, the tabernacle of David is when we read this book, we believe it. We see the claims of Christ. We don't shy away from it. We see again what we're to be as the followers of Jesus Christ. We don't try to change it. We don't try to alter it. We don't try to make it palatable. Because really to follow Christ means that we're entering into a life of selflessness. We're entering into a life of being given for the needs of others. We're not going to church to pursue something for ourselves. We're seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And the Lord says, no, you go that way and I'll add everything to you that you need. You begin to move to the needs around you. And as you do, I'll open your prison doors and I'll put clothes in your back and I'll put food in your belly. I'll look after these things. I'll give you a roof over your head. But you move this way. You go this way. You move where I clearly have told you in the Word of God that you're to move. You come outside of yourself. Come outside of this love of self that so permeates the society all around us. Don't use God for yourself. Let, let Christ, yes, come and save you. But beyond that salvation, begin to move into the work of God. And then you'll find everything you need will come. Your children need a touch from heaven. I'll touch them, God says. Covenant involves not only you, but your family. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Praise be to God. God says, I'll raise again this tabernacle of David that's fallen down. This tabernacle of David in 1 Chronicles 21 is a place where David came to because of his own foolishness. Because of counting his numbers as it is, a plague broke out among the people. And a Finally, after many, many had died, there was an angel standing over Jerusalem with a sword drawn. And an ordinary man with a couple of kids who's threshing in a, in a place of wheat looked up and saw this angel and saw the need. And then he looked down and saw the king coming towards him. What a picture of Christ coming to his church again, coming to the ordinary man, praise God. And David comes to him humbly and says, I need what you have, but I'll pay a price for it. I won't take it for free from you. I'll pay the full price. Thanks be to God. God comes to his church in this hour and says, I need what you have, and I paid the full price for it. I paid with my blood that I might dwell within you, that I might have you as a physical body on this side of eternity, that I might walk through you, that I might flow through you, speak through you, and touch through your lives. Ornan looked up and saw this judgment hanging over the city, looked down and saw the king coming in humility towards him. And he looked, he said, you can have everything I have. I give it to you. I don't ask you for a thing. It's all yours. I see the need and it's all yours. Praise be to God. And David was given 
a revelation immediately as soon as this man gave everything in chapter 22 and verse 1 of first chronicles david said this is the house of the lord god this is the altar of the burnt offering for israel david finally his eyes are open he said this is what it's all about this is where god dwells god dwells with ordinary men like this man ornan and his family ordinary people who see the depth of the need and they give the little that they have that the need might be met this is where god dwells this is the tabernacle of david this is the house of God. Ordinary people like you and me, praise be to God, who don't, we don't have an army. We don't, we don't have military skill. We, we don't have the means to stop what we see to be this all encroaching judgment in our society today. And we don't see ourselves the way God sees us though. The Lord says, no, you have exactly what I need. Just, just give me the little you have and watch what I'm going to be able to do with it. Praise be to God. David and the people entered into this willingness themselves to give of themselves. First Chronicles 29, verses 17 and 18. David said, as for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. Now, this is David preparing to build a temple, a, play, a dwelling place for God. I've, I've willingly offered all these things. And now I have seen with joy your people which are present here to offer willingly unto you. David put a call out to the people and said, no, this is where God dwells. God dwells where there's a people who are willing to give to his work, not necessarily expecting anything in return, but his presence is sufficient for them. And David said, I've willingly given, and I see now your people here with me that are also willingly giving for the purpose, for a higher purpose, because David knew it was at this place that judgment was averted. It was at this place that death was turned to life and darkness was made light again. And he says these words, O oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and all Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of the people and prepare their heart unto thee. David said, Oh God, I see something. I see this is where you dwell. I see this is where your power is. I see this is how the plague of judgment is stopped. Please, God, David says, keep this in the imagination of the hearts of the people forever. Not just in Israel, but forever. He saw into the future. He saw perhaps in the spirit into our day. God, keep this in the hearts of the people. We're living at a time when people are using Christ for their own gain. This is not where the power of God is. This will never stop this encroaching darkness that seems to be all over our society today. Folks, if you don't believe it's getting dark, come down to Manhattan at 11 o'clock on a Friday night. Just walk a few blocks and see what's happening now. See the darkness that is coming. See the justice of God being held off just momentarily. Now all of this foreshadowed Jesus Christ who speaking about his own life in John 10, 18, said, No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I lay it down. Nobody takes my life. It's a free choice that I'm making to lay it down for the betterment of others. Paul, to the Corinthian church, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he speaks in type of this giving of ourselves for others. He says, <clears throat> go to 1 Corinthians 11. I'm going to close there. A scripture we're very, very familiar with and I've spoken on several times in this church. But here's what Paul says in verse 23. For I've received of the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. You show this giving heart of God as you come, not in selfishness, but in selflessness. You show the reason that God became a man. You show the truth. Of the fact that God became a man and died on the cross for all of humanity. You show it, in a sense, as much as you are willing to be partakers of it. 
You see, Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth. They're shoving the poor to the sides of the temple. They're, they're meeting around what makes them comfortable. And Paul said, this is not the Christ. This is not the Christ that I received. The Christ that I received and preached to you, he said, gave of himself and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And allowed his own blood to be poured out to the last drop of blood and water for you. And he says, as much as you are partakers of this, as much as this is the reason why you even come to Christ and say, I am in fellowship with him. You show the reason. You show this heart of God to this generation until he comes. Praise be to God. Prophet Amos, let me just finish it for you. Says it this way. They may possess the remnant of Edom. And of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. When I raise up again the tabernacle of David, he said, selfishness will be overcome. Edom is Esau. is a man who sold his birthright for a bowl of soup, literally. This self-seeking will be overcome. Remember that Paul said, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. He'll not allow you to be tempted or tested beyond you can bear, but will make a way. That you can escape it. He says, the days come, saith the Lord. And I want to conclude with this thought. That the plowman shall overtake the reaper. And the treader of grapes him that soweth seed. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine and the hills shall melt. The day shall come, says the Lord, that there will be a people. A selfless people. And they will be able to lead others into the abundance of the life of God. Praise be to God. I do see a day coming, folks, when the person, persons who are discipling new converts can't keep up with the people who are preaching or vice versa. There's going to be so many. There will always be a, there will almost be a, like, Pastor, can you just hold back and can you just teach on something else for a little while? We can't handle the volumes of people coming in. Praise be to God. There will be an overtaking. When God says, when I have a people who understand this tabernacle of David, when I have a people who understand what it means to be in Christ and to have Christ in them, when once again I have a people that possess my heart and are able to take that heart to fallen humanity, there will be an influx, a harvest, an abundance. It can only come through selflessness. There is no other way. You see why the devil fights so hard to produce a selfish church? Because there's no power in it. There never will be. He knows that. It's the theology of Eden. He says this will satisfy your flesh. This is pleasing to your eyes. And it will make you very, very smart. But it takes you away. You see, the abundance is people. That's the abundance. It's souls coming into the kingdom of God. That's what divides those who are Christ from those who aren't. It's a God-breathed burden for other people. Simple acts of mercy speak so much louder than anything we can preach. Praise be to God. I know there are people here this morning who are facing incredible temptations, trials. But the Lord says to you today, if you'll just get up and move to my work, I'll open your prison doors. I'll heal your bruised heart. I'll give you spiritual sight. I'll release you from your captivity. If you will just get up and move to my work, move to what I do, rebuild this tabernacle of David in your heart. And in your life, which is Christ. It's the life of Christ. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Would you stand, please? In the annex and here in the main sanctuary, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. You say, Pastor, I, I'm, I'm just moving to this life that God's calling me to. And as you do... You're going to find the strength to get through your trial. You're going to find a way through the difficult days that you're finding yourself in right now. If you'll just make the decision 
seems rather odd to move towards one thing to receive another. But that's the way the kingdom of God works. Move towards the plan of God through your life. Move towards other people. Some people would say this morning, hey, I, I came here to find an answer to my problem. Well, you did find an answer. It's just a matter of whether or not you're open to hear it. Move towards, move towards the will of God for your life. If you're willing to do that, you're going to see these other things just start falling away. They will just start falling away. All of these bondages and afflictions and trials, all of these things, if you just simply move towards Christ and allowing him to have his way through your life, you'll find these things begin to fall away. Praise God. We're going to worship for a little while as we do. You may make your way down if you want to and join these that have come. Seems almost odd today to come to church and not hear a message about ourselves. But a message that's focused on others. If, if we only hear this as a message, then we will... We will just put it in our catalog of tapes and go back to it once in a while. But it's not a message. It's something God's speaking to us. This time, this house, this generation. We've got to hear this, beloved. I would. We, there's been a, a tendency in modern day preaching that success is measured by how we fill the altars. I thank God there's always been an open altar in this house and many have come to Christ here and I thank God for that but I would rather have just a dozen one of them being a Joseph another an Esther one of Moses in our generation than to have 500 and people who could just walk out the door unchanged unchallenged unmoved to to finally make that last step and say Lord my whole life is yours you do with me what you will you take me where you want me to go you make me what you want me to be. That is where the power of God is found. Bless God. Bless God. Father, thank you, Lord, for this altar today. Thank you, Lord, that there are Davids here. There are Esthers here. There are mighty men and women of God. Lord, and they're not mighty to look at because your word says clearly. You told the Corinthian church, look, consider your calling. Not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise. Not many after the flesh, Lord, but God's called the foolish. And those things that are nothing, to bring to nothing things that are, that no flesh can glory in his presence. I thank you that there are mighty, there are Gideons here at this altar today, mighty men and women of God who will go forward if they do not draw back. And Lord, you will be brought to great glory through their lives. I thank you for it, God. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us a depth in this house, not to only approach you for our own need, but also that you flow through us to the needs of others. This is the final work of your Holy Spirit in us. I thank you for it, Lord. Thank you, God. You promised that as we move in this, you'll meet our needs. You'll meet our needs, Lord. You'll bring our families together. You'll fight for our children, God. You'll put a roof over us. You'll give us food, Lord. We will not, not need these things, Lord. You said if we will move to your kingdom, if we will move to what's your work on the earth, Lord, you will provide. You'll open prison doors. I believe it even this morning. As we pray, prison doors are opening. And I proclaim liberty to the captives today. I proclaim freedom in the name of Jesus Christ. To those who are bound by a fear of the future, a fear of tomorrow, a fear of failure, all types of fear. I stand against this and... I proclaim it to have no effect and no force in your life anymore. Father, I thank you, Lord. I pray, God, for those who are addicted to pornography. I pray this morning for a release of the mind, a cleansing of the mind. Oh, God, I thank you for this, Lord. I pray, God, for those who are in ungodly practices, for the strength and the power to turn from these things and to be honest men and women in the marketplace and to do justly, I pray for those who are writing receipts under the table or doing things that are wrong and they know they're wrong. I thank you, God. You're going to give every man and woman at this altar and in this house the power to live righteously in this world. That we be a savor of Christ, not a savor of Satan, but a savor of Christ in this world as we walk through 
the corridors and marketplaces. I pray for those who are just embarking on this journey of life. I ask God that they have the wisdom to make the right decision and to give their entire future and all that they are into your hand to be used for your good. Oh God, I pray for this church. I pray that out of this church, that men and women called of you will go everywhere into all markets, oh God, all places, all countries, and they will bring this life of Christ with them. They will stand in the power of God. They will not have theories and formulas, Lord. They will have the living Christ within them and and a heart of compassion for all men. I pray, God, for a liberality that you could, from our lives, begin to be generous through us that we might begin to know the generosity of heaven, the true generosity of God in Jesus Christ. Father, deliver this church from being selfish. Deliver us, God, from the spirit of this city. Let not the lust for fame and money and the things in this city and influence and power, let it not be found or named among the people of God. Let there not be murmuring and complaining in this house. God Almighty, let us not be divided by race. Lord, we see this in our, uh, in our country now. Even through these elections, Lord, we see this division. Lord, let there be no division here. Let there be a unity, a love for one another that's only found in Christ. Make this house a testimony to this city and to the world of Jesus Christ being alive from the dead. Very real, very alive in the body of believers known as His church in the world. Father, we thank You, God. We praise You for this. We give You all the glory in Jesus' name. Let's thank Him. We've got to praise Him. Bless God.